you are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners. So let's be friends. Today, we're going to talk about, I don't know, Formula One for a change, but why not bring in some people that know exactly what they're talking about? So the least interesting one first, as always, is Matt Two Rumpets. Hello, Matt. People are used to you. You're not special. I'm not. But question. If you go far enough around, does oversteer then become understeer? That's going to be a really good question because we're talking to someone who has handfuls of both in historic cars at the moment. It's Mr. Alex Brundle. Hello, Alex. Hello. I, I think they do join in the middle eventually, don't they? And uh, and then you end up with just steer. Uh, and, that, <laughs> and, that, that is, that's, and it becomes existential and interesting. So uh, obviously we, uh, we're going to talk some F1 news. Felipe Massa has finally brought that lawsuit um, to fruition. Mercedes seem very sad. And we've got a lot of other stuff to talk about as well. And my assertion that the Groove Tire era, Groove Tire era was the best era of Formula One ever. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting general agreement in the background. Uh, but before that, I do want to speak to Alex about what he's doing with historic cars. And I just want to also remind you that we're an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. Yeah, Alex Brundle, I don't think this is going to be controversial when I say I'm jealous of you and your life is better than mine. You're either commentating on fast cars or in them. Uh, like You do look like you've got a packed schedule of things that make a lot of people jealous at the moment. It's going to be a crazy year, um, and uh, yeah, there are there are there are more non glamorous bits than than you imagine. No, as with everything, I'm only looking um, at the Instagram. That's it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Is it? It's a solid edit into a <laughs> nice little box of of looking great. But Nurburgring's a cool place to be. I'll be there this year um, with the VLN series, and also oh, VLN. We're supposed to call it NLS. Oh, now. that's politics. Um, and the Nurburgring twenty four hours. Um, of course, the work. Um, with F2, F3 and F1 TV continues. That feels like the day job. Uh, and then I had a bit of an off-the-wall idea um, to launch a team in the style that, I, uh, that I've seen throughout my years in, uh, in sports car racing, but only for historic cars, because I think they're awesome and I think that more people should be watching, working on and generally engaging with them. Wait, so the, the Mart- this, is the, uh, sorry, this is the Alex Brundle... Uh, Brundle Motorsport. Is that what you're calling it? Brundle Motorsport. Is it just a team or a series? It's a team. Mm. So we will have we'll have four cars, three of which is announced, one of which is in build, and I will literally go and hammer bit to it. Um, I've done a day on that already, and I'm terrible, and it's hilarious. Um, but, you know, that's to be expected. And really the point of it is just to showcase that kind of racing. You know, I endlessly hear, I endlessly see... People say race cars, they don't move around and slide around enough. They're not loud enough. They're, and I know you're going to talk about groove tires. I know, but they're, they're, they're not loud enough. Um, and we want to see racing how it always used to be with our big road tinted specs on. And we love that stuff. Um, but that kind of racing is going on all the time. It's just really opaque, really hard to find and really difficult to explain where it's going on and when. So I I kind of taken it upon myself to like build a bridge via this little organization from the world of people who might watch Lewis Hamilton on a weekend to the world of people who are really into running cars that raced in 1964 yeah and you can be that bridge of course i can't legally consume your f1 coverage but i think there are a lot of people who somehow find a find a way and of course the americans will hear you as a big voice in formula one uh and so if you if you peer pressure us all into watching things i think like what did you you insulted me in some way of there's a lot of people who are obsessed with f1 and don't understand that other motorsport exists and most of the other motorsport i see is through your Instagram feed. So you are having a small effect on me, at least. 
Just a t- just a tiny just edging a wind me. blowing you. Just edging me in there it. because it's the onboard shots that you seem to do really well. Uh, you sort of do over the shoulder cams, and as Matt was talking about with the over steer and under steer, when you're driving those historic cars, it's you've just look like you've got an armful constantly, like you're constantly having to fight them. Is that just because of the type of car they are? Is it was it the age of the the car? Yeah, that's that's just the limit of grip in a car of that era. And that's why it took so much skill, you know, like artistic skill in in many ways, you know, uh, skill in the same way that someone who builds a house has skill. You know, uh, they were almost tradesmen back in the day, whereas, you know, now we're dealing with operators uh, very much in terms of modern motorsport. But, you know, there are loads of young people, middle-aged people, old people, whatever, out there scrolling through their Instagram feeds, wondering what to do with their time. And, you know, if I have my two penneth worth, I'm basically making up a feed, which in a roundabout way, by showing them how larry and amazing it is, says, hey, you know, why not get involved with this? And we need those people because we need those cars running. Uh, Otherwise, we'll lose them to a shed i mean lots of good things do happen in sheds i I, don't get me wrong but we'll lose them to a shed (laughs) and they'll rot into nothingness yeah well actually that's one of my first questions because when you're driving these cars these historic cars they're not going to make another one so if you're driving a prototype it's kind of expected you're going to thrash that the bits will fall off you'll build new bits if you're in like this classic car is there a part of you that goes well yeah i cannot put this in the wall Exactly that, you know, and that's where the jeopardy and interest is. You know, there's there's risk, there's reward as well. You know, uh, when you go and drive a McLaren GT3 car, the, the Sebring 12 Hours is going on as we speak. There are yeah, probably, I would say, 70, 80 of them racing around the world um, throughout the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you bin it, they'll build you, they'll build you another one. That car yeah. will depreciate. Uh, and slowly become defunct when you go and race a historic car if you win in it it's actually worth more than it was yesterday and if you lose in it you've got a chance to lose everything so there's a huge amount of jeopardy here and the level of drive i mean we have this perception that it's sort of a load of blokes in blazers wandering around uh kind of showing off to each other uh, about about their old bits of kit I start. I started the Spa Six Hours Classic, which is a long uh, race in Belgium, uh, Spa Francorchamps, the F1 circuit, last year, with Nick Manassian, Le Mans winner, in front of me, uh, British uh, touring car legend Rob Huff behind me, World Touring Car Champion Andy Prio behind that. So there's all this racing going on with awesome drivers flat out sideways in these mega roll cars, and everyone's just you know not come across it yet I, I, please watch it it takes um, some it, t- it takes some names sort of to appear in it because there was one last year i think it was a bit of an endurance event that i did only tune into because you were there and i think your car ended up uh, having a gearbox issue towards the end but there was some sounds like me cool- <laughs> is brundle a gearbox wrecker um but yeah there was sort of um varied running but there's uh, there's always a variety of cars on the track as well so a part of it is a bit of an exhibition but how competitive do the drivers really get once they get behind that wheel or you know is there an owner behind there going oh mate steady on the uh steady on the old clutch there, there's a bit of both you know because um right at the front I drive cars um, like I would have done in the World Endurance Championship. So I'm literally flat out. Um, But then there are a group of individuals sort of hanging around in the mid to the back of the races who are just interesting people with weird cars. And they are, you know, either to the manner born in some in some respect or wildly successful and interesting in other respects and that's another cool part about the area of the sport i drove a rover three days ago uh for a guy who when you talk advertising knows the business in inwards outwards and backwards and just a chance to sit with these guys and listen to what they have to say 
is uh, is yeah. a kind of insightful if you're interested in business as, as well as race cars. No, just let's do the race cars. So when you, because uh, we're going to get into dentistry, presumably, that's the, the trope, isn't it? That's the stereotype. Uh, so on the oversteer, understeer, I saw a video of you in the, I think it's the, what do you call it the 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 Brustang? The because Brustang. the Brundle Mustang. Um, that's the blue one, right? That's how I, st- I, I stole the concept from a from a guy who lives in California, who is a, a lawyer in the IMSA paddock, and he he's called Dustin, and he has a Mustang called the Dustang, Dustin. and he suggested it, and then I had and then I had a sort of weird, interesting rights conversation with him over Instagram. Over can I steal? How much can I steal it? <laughs> um, and so when you're driving that though, the first thing i noticed was like on on an exit i think it was around silverstone like there's just so much understeer and you're almost like willing it towards the exit um until there isn't understeer and then you've got the the back end coming out so like it's, there's just so much more to manipulate if you had a full grid of like your you know up and coming f3 f2 stars and you threw them in those cars and said you know don't worry about wrecking them you know would would the modern driver be able to adapt to that readily given as it seems so easy in the single seaters. So that's what kind of happens at Goodwood, at the Goodwood Revival. They invite a load of modern drivers along and then they throw them in the cars and they run the race as it used to be. Um, But exactly as it used to be, same cars, same everything with today's drivers. It's really interesting. Some take to it like a duck to water and are meteorically quick. Others broken gearbox in two corners <laughs> so it, it, it's an it's an incredibly interesting thing um and that's a little bit like what we're going to be doing this year with brundle motorsport so taking legends of the sport previously so uh people who've raced at le mans people who've raced yeah. out where, elsewhere but also people like youtubers and modern young racing drivers and just throwing them at historic racing cars and going begin go i did notice that you said you were putting some influences in the car like how how influential do they have to be hundred thousand devices downloaded an episode of mistake but i'm just saying (laughs) just saying but no you've got the likes of like did i see you've got broadbent uh jimmy broadbent you're chucking him in there but that's cheating because he does a racing series anyway well he does the same racing series as 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 me over in the over in the nls so uh, yeah jimmy broadbent will be involved in some capacity again and you know there aren't huge criteria i mean i'm not sitting down plowing through metrics on this stuff but um i just you know people who are passionate about cars of the right spirit and can help us you know spread the word of awesomeness that is you know skidding v8 touring cars and sports cars around flat out with no downfalls <laughs> um is all i'm looking for Okay, so I have a question for you. It seems like you have, with your with this journey, you've come to sort of an inflection point. But it started with the Brustang. Now, you may not know this, but I had a friend who owned a Mustang, and I got to drive it back in the 80s. And, you know, it was pretty fast. It was a 289 manual three-speed. But it handled like a broken shopping cart. So what made you get into this car and say, this is perfect for racing? So I, I wanted a car... <laughs> Uh, to to begin with where you i mean because a lot of these historic cars it's it's pretty difficult to explain to a casual viewer or even a viewer is generally interested in motorsport like what is it and what is it is generally you know especially if you sit down with some of the nigels of the historic racing paddock and they'll tell you uh, and of course they're incredibly proud about their their car and every, and so on and so forth can be a 20 to 30 minute conversation. I I wanted a car where everybody looks at it and goes, that's a Mustang. And because that's the whole point of the program is that we take, we generate an entry point based around the things that people know and then lead them off into the depths of interest of, of, of this sport. And also it's accessible. It's not outrageously expensive. People who watch that car, I mean, yeah, in racing terms. Yeah. <laughs> people who watch that car. Sorry, I was just laughing uh, in working class. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just the whole thing, but whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, but people who watch that car might be able to imagine that if with a sequence of green ticks in the box in business terms or similar, they might be able to jump in it. 
um and, and also they're just wild to drive and and make good make good telly so that was the aim of that okay a uh, quick follow up then you've got four cars now what is Correct. a car that you've not had a chance to sample that is highest on your list? Oh, what's the, the one that cars? you're like, I'd yeah. really like to get in that one and just thrash it around for a few laps. So, I mean, I've had the privilege of driving loads, 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 loads of cars now. Um, uh, four cars being a GT40, uh, a Mustang, uh, E-Type Jaguar, which we, we've come to an agreement to run uh, more than more than we more than owning it. Um but and then there's a there's a fourth one which I'm not going to reveal because I want to reveal it over Instagram and oh, we're going to build no it. Exclusive. It's going to mm. it's be an art car. How about that? There we go. It's a we're going to we're going to livery it in an interesting manner. Um, I would like a Mark. I would like a Mark One Escort. I think unless you've had a Mark One Escort at some point in your life, <laughs> your life is not complete. Rally uh, Spanners, you it know is, what Mark uh, yeah, One I've, Escort I've is. Actually, I had the gear model. Uh, which is was like the sports badged model of it, uh, but I got it when it was like twenty years old. So I think it was actually from the seventies, and I didn't know I got it for two hundred quid, and I was well pleased. And then the insurance was something like two and a half grand, and I went, oh, I can't afford to run it, <laughs> so I made that. Up. But yeah, all the all these things that would basically have been street furniture, you know, in the eighties and nineties, I, I guess a little bit older. Um, uh, if you can get a Vauxhall Nova in there somewhere, that'll be my nineties part beating as well but that's probably a bit modern for you well there there are some amazing sports cars of sort of like the steve mcqueen le mans movie era that are really f for me the pinnacle of you know historic racing 917s you can't rerun really them anymore they're just a bit soft and squishy and they break on new tires but the ferrari 512s the lola t70s that kind of that kind of era of car just make for outrageously uh outrageously good racing but we'll have a crack at anything i saw you in a in a sort of almost cigar tube type one that was a, an open cockpit like a classic yeah. what was lotus, that one lotus 27 oh right okay yeah yeah that looks that looks glorious i should have guessed by the by the green but those things you know skinny tires no grip you're you're slowly guiding me aren't we aren't you back, back to f1 to the world <laughs> of formula one <laughs> via <laughs> via a single no, no, look, I, I tell you what feel, feel 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 free to bring the vintage cars back into it at any time but the the the, the link in to formula one and me talking about groove tires really does come down to that you know, lack of grip. And so uh, it was uh, Matt Bishop shared a, a video of who's the driver that everyone pretends they think is the greatest. Jim Clark. Yeah. The, a lot of 20 year olds are like, uh, actually, Jim Clark's the greatest ever. Shut up. You're 20. So uh, there was a picture of him drifting in a in a in some kind of sports car. Um, Lotus 14. Was it? And, and like that. fully sideways into the corner. But is it that he was driving that to an extreme or is that just how you had to drive those old cars that's the driving style that's the driving style because mm. you're now and i i have uh trumpets um malving cross ply tires oh, at me. And, and honestly oh. that's the that's the joy of it you just don't see you just don't see cars driven like that that anymore um, but that's the fast way around because of the profile of grip of a cross ply tire uh you can go sideways while still going forwards. And if you get the car sliding in a four wheel drift like that, and you're flat out on the throttle, you're turning and going and turning and going at the same time is magic numbers in terms of doing, doing a fast, doing a fast lap. So it's literally the fast way round. What I find incredible about it. And, and a guy called Gordon Shedden is probably uh, alongside Rob Huff, um, two, two mega touring car drivers uh, are probably some of the best guys at this um, is how amazingly fast some modern drivers get their head around the concept coming from a slicks and wings or, or even a very grippy touring car, get their head around the concept of neutral steering throttle on uh, motorsport. Uh, it's really impressive to watch. Okay. I, I am impressed but keeping this F1 adjacent here, one one claim you have made about your breast tank is that you're running it on synthetic fuel. And that's uh. an area where Formula One is headed. And I really feel like we've had the program on long enough. Spanners will let me be boring for a second and ask you about it. It's been 10 years, Matt. Have I ever stopped you being boring? <laughs> well, to be fair. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's a big factor. We've got a sequence of videos which will come out, actually, uh, when we run into the Goodwood members meeting, which is sort of little Goodwood. Um, there's there's the big Goodwood, which is the Goodwood revival, and then there's little Goodwood <laughs> at the start of the year. Um, and, and basically, we take that Mustang to a rolling road, which is a dyno essentially yeah. for an engine testing facility we try it on uh natural fuel or normal fuel and then it, uh, anglo-american supply us with the the synthetic fuel and we literally try it out and 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 show the graphs on screen same talk same power In, i mean there's there's an amazing quote from mr Bean, rowan atkinson who is incredibly involved in, in all of this it's a weird a weird character to have involved in all of this but he's a petrol head extraordinaire yeah i know where says, i know where he lives oh yeah i've seen him well, going into his house sorry so <laughs> yeah <laughs> he'll thank you if you don't say okay, so on air i'd imagine but um he basically says who would imagine this stuff we we we've constructed to burn especially in an engine would be better than this gloop we found in the ground <laughs> that's like, really good <laughs> yeah that's a really good point <laughs> that's <laughs> which is quite a good point isn't it that's that is a good point yeah because it's often the yeah, it's the opposite of the naturalistic fallacy my concern and this is what i argue with the guys here is uh, if you're going for road relevance you can't make enough of that synthetic fuel to for for everyone so I, I, that's why I'm a bit lost why F1 wants to go down that road when, you know, they're talking about road relevance. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit the same of, uh, as the fact that there are not enough battery charging points for everybody if everybody used electric cars all at once. So effectively, you've got to start at some point. Um, and I believe this is sort of the start. Um, I, I would say from a you know, from a synthetic fuel standpoint, you can pump it through normal pumps. So that's a, that's a, and all of the, and all of the infrastructure is there. The cars can just run on it now, the cars that actually exist, oh, that right. we've yeah. already made. And so, you know, I, I, I see it as a leading solution, but yeah, I mean, it takes all sorts and it's, it's cool to be part of the solution. Uh, hopefully. I mean, there are a lot of people that would argue that you're part of the problem at the same time, but uh, you know, well, I, we I, I personally, I, I, I hate that motorsport tries to be road relevant. I think it should just be what it is. You know, is horse racing road relevant? No, we stopped riding horses, but we still want to see horse racing and do dressage, the one where they dance, the dancey horses. Do you know what I mean? The dancey horses doesn't need to be road relevant. And I don't think Alex Brundle tearing around in a Mustang needs to be necessarily road relevant anyway it's an art form into itself but i understand there's a lot of pressure uh you know from the world when they they look at motorsport and on the surface it looks like it's doing you know damage but there's not many of you is it it's only you and that guy in sales and that dentist i mean let, let's get let's get real by the time you've flown two rugby teams to <laughs> fiji Mm. uh you know flown all of the crowd there uh who want to go there and then turn the lights on in the stadium the the amount of power that you've used to power 20 formula one cars is utterly dwarfed um so that, that that's the reality of all of it so you'd have to cancel yeah. literally everything but that doesn't mean that we can't like try, try. or, 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 or be a, a leading edge of the arrow point and explore those technologies but that, matt that's the argument i had with you about tire blankets I said they probably use more power in the hot dog stands at Silverstone than they do oh, no. warming up the tire blankets. And I in looked total. up what tire blankets were rated for and how long they use them for. And it's actually, I oh, think, a lot of power. That. But you, you know, know we're going to do that maths. Know. We're going to do that maths. Yeah. Go on. I, I, I think our guest might have an insight on how hot much power <laughs> they draw. Yeah, well, it's it's obviously a heating element, which is probably one of the most resistance heavy. Mm, yeah, um, that's his part, job. You know, electronic devices that there are. So, yeah, obviously, a heating element literally resists electric current <laughs> until it burns with temperature. So that's 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 a big thing. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of kettles, isn't it? Um, to be to be running, but then you look how much jet fuel you pour in a you know in a jumbo to take a formula e grid from one country to another and again even the tire even the tire situation is wrong but you you know it i don't think you can get too what about ish about 
you know, power usage of this and that. It's easy for everybody to stand in a circle pointing at each other going, well, they're worse hot dogs and nobody worse. actually tries to do anything. I just want a hot dog now or some nachos. That'd be good. Yeah, my diet's not going well. Um, so when we're <laughs> when you're yeah you're going around in these these cars, uh, you're you're feeling basically everything that we've lost in in Formula One, and that's why I tweeted correctly that the groove tire era was uh, the best era of Formula One. And but what I really mean by that is, I mean towards the end there was some really great racing in that era, but what I really mean is it feels like it came from a time in Formula One where they understood that the designers needed to be clipped back and that they couldn't just get be having more and more grip and more and more downforce forever. And then suddenly that just disappeared. And I, it, I mean, we, get, we get to 2017 and they almost did the opposite. They went, right, we're going to do the ultimate amount of downforce, the ultimate amount of grip. And then, ev- and then we're going to have no tyre wear as well on top of that. And then it just, F1 hasn't really recovered from that. So we, I think we should be more Alex in a Mustang than maximum downforce scenario. That's why I say that was the best era for me. Well, it depends which groove tyre era you're talking about, because, I mean, there's there's a great groove tyre era sort of immediately post-war. I wasn't around for uh, Okay, the, well, let, me, <laughs> let me clarify. <laughs> there, was, there was some incredible racing. There was some incredible racing in that era. But the, the problem I have with that, Spanners, is that those cars lost mechanical grip but they still had a lot of downforce. And and the issue you have with cars with a lot of downforce, and now I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, I wouldn't put it in such a short sentence. You can do but it. But I... Uh, <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> I don't know if I mean... If you've got no mechanical grip, then, then it means that you've got nothing to turn the car with when you're in the aero wash of the car ahead, which means that you can't race very well nose to tail. So that was the problem with that era. And they were going, they were trying to slow the cars down in that era. That's why yes. they grew. That's yeah. why they grew the tires because they, they, the speeds were getting incredible, you know, obnoxiously incredible. Um, but in doing so, I, I do think they cost themselves a bit of racing. Of course, racing drivers have a habit of, you know, going past each other, having crazy moments and bumping into each other, whatever you give them. So there's always some great racing to watch. Uh, Well, I would just add on to that. It actually, I think it created your worst nightmare because having removed the mechanical grip the teams relied upon, it essentially supercharged the kind of arrow that is now making you completely nuts. So essentially you took mechanical grip away from the teams the team said, well, we have to figure out how to go faster. Oh, let's spend all our monies on aerodynamics now. And then it oh. doesn't matter so much that our tires aren't perfect because we can just overcome that with maximum downforce. Oh, OK, OK, OK. You, you, I, I hate like moving sides of an argument mid, mid-debate, mid but now you're the winglet wars. Wasn't that something that came out of that or was that a little bit later where they suddenly started sprouting all these, these Thor-like wings? Yeah, lots of little sort of random bits of, you know, kind of what well, they were like sort of they call it the monkey seat, don't they? That yeah. sits on the on the top of the on the top of the rear of the the engine cover and that kind of thing. All of that, by the way, is about transmission of downforce as much as it is about actually um as much as it is about actually uh, making downforce. You try and get downforce as close as you can to the point where it's transmitted to the road, which is why brake ducts are so important because they're unsprung downforce production in many instances. But yeah, so it's nah. sticking the, the they're so ugly. S- that stuff's so ugly. Sticking man. the rear wheels to the the back is that that that's what you're saying? Uh, oh, I don't know. No, I got, I'm trying. I got lost when I got lost in what you were saying. To be honest, but if you wanted, to... I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm talking about the 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 winglets being closer to the point where the downforce meets the road, because the only bit of the car that right. ever touches the road is the tire. And it, so, if it was higher up, it's less efficient at doing that. Yeah. So if you if you have winglets that are closer, obviously to the the where the downforce is transmitted, you lose less downforce transmitting it all through the wing hangers and the chassis you're just putting it directly speak of ugly if ugly matters and i don't know if it does the i, I actually i missed the the sails what, what year was that where they had the sails on the top of the engine covers like the full banner and then you'd have the driver's number and name on there that was in the hybrid era i think wasn't it i like those but they the drivers would complain that 
that basically it was either on or off with the downforce. And as soon as they they tried to turn, it would just turn off and then you'd have those spins. Uh, but yeah, okay. Well, I don't think you're... I, don't, I think that you're making a, a good case for why that wasn't the right move in that it's removing mechanical grip. But do you at least agree with the ethos? Because you could go to a place where you go, all right, let's have four individually driven wheels. You can do that as we get more electrical power. We could make it so that it's flat out around hairpins and, and then that would just remove all racing so there's got to come a point where you go enough's enough with the grip i think downforce i mean you know downforce is a really interesting concept in motorsport and it's something that we've got so used to seeing the speed of that it's actually a little bit self-defeating um you know you talk about road relevance um somebody managed to come up with one eventually when i asked this question i last asked it boringly and anecdotally um but i I can't think of any method of transport that requires downforce to get from a to b to actually arrive at its destination okay you've got supercars with downforce on but Mm. that's mainly to imitate racing cars nothing needs downforce to get where it's going so that's only a racing thing um and it really, if you're asking racing machines to race close together, downforce is a real nightmare. I would only follow up with, the, when we talk about downforce, the flip side of any downforce is drag. And if we just take, for example, our current uh, spec of cars, and uh, there's a great article by Summers talking about rear wings and how the chase for efficiency more downforce with less drag is um, is is really what's holding teams back from from bringing a proper challenge. The other thing I would bring up, just because I'm annoyingly pedantic in some instances, would be like a car like the Audi TT, where they added a little lip, which did create downforce and then made the whole car stable. So there are some very few instances where understanding the overall, I guess you might, you could even go with like, say, aerodynamic balance instead could be important to road cars, but it's not, uh, you were correct. It's not like a major factor. Uh, it's mit- it's mitigation of lift as much yeah. as anything on a, 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 with a, with a current road car. Um, the caveat would be that it's sort of, unless you're planning on breaking the speed limit relatively heavily, I don't think you'll ever actually really need that uh, that level of stability but I, I i mean i get you i guess you get the thrust of uh my my point that moment when you know teams in formula one and sports cars went if we just flip that wing upside down and put it over the rear axle we seem to go a lot faster actually has cost us a lot of racing action uh over the years mm. a lot of technical interest but a lot of racing action well you're, you're close to the the heart of formula one are there people are there people with regulation makers decision makers really starting to put pressure on about the kind of lack of action at the moment because you know surely liberty media aren't happy that their product is getting slated and it is you know like we're addicts we're going to keep watching it wherever uh but you know does, is there no pressure internally to go come on guys Let's let's make these cars so that, that we can pass. And is 2026 going to solve that is, is the question, I suppose. I think they can, they can pass. Uh, I, I do think they can pass. I just think that you've got one outfit doing such a better job than the rest of the field that nobody can get close enough to pass them. And that's that's the issue. That's the that's the the action cost at the moment. Um, you're always walking that tightrope, aren't you? Because Formula One markets itself and stands by and i and i believe they're correct to stand by the fact it's a constructor formula you build your own car it's not a delara indy car it's a car that they've built at their hq okay long conversation to be had about how many bits um you know rb share with red bull but there's a you know that's another direction for the conversation to go in um so my my question that you have a question really is what's the opportunity cost of having of making teams so they're always closely or like balance of yeah. performancing formula one and the opportunity cost is it stops being a constructor formula which would be a disaster for it from a commercial perspective uh and also take away 
a lot of what's great about the sport. So it's a tricky one, that. Yeah, I know. I think it's just the modern sensibilities, isn't it? It's because, you know, if you look at back and try and watch any film from the 80s and that you used to love and now you go, blimey, actually, it, this drags on. <laughs> it's a bit dull. So, we, you know, we, we fell in love, well, I fell in love with F1 in the 80s. Uh, but I don't think I would be able to sit through 80s F1 now. No offence to anybody's relatives that may have been racing then. But the, I don't think modern audiences, even who watched in the 80s, would accept that kind of action now. Like the, And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. We just want a little bit more. And so that's why the whole sprint weekend thing, even though we're resisting it, like they've sort of got a point that, that, that we want more. So at some point, F1 might have to make the decision to go, OK, we need a bit more entertainment over pure 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 constructor constructor i think that you know and you'll you'll see it from your analytics from the the online broadcasts that you do an audience decides whether they are enjoying what you're doing and saying and and in the way you're entertaining them within the first three seconds of of anything of anything and that's the audience that we're dealing with right now uh, i completely mirror your point i got down a youtube rabbit a hole the other day of old bbc reports of of motoring you know when seat belts first came oh my in god the protest yes. i was telling this to okay. my kids people were angry that you had to wear seat belts yeah and and a big i was looking for a car and blah 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 um and i i i'm watching this news report sitting there and my mind is going get to the point get to the point get to the point get to the point because they they mess about well they don't mess about they just explain it in slow detail people accepted that back then because there were a number of channels that were very small and that was the only thing on now you can't handle it uh, even on like tiktok right somebody will say um, here's this mystery and uh, people are confused about it let me explain and then they go, I'm Dr. Such and Such. And I go, mate, I don't want to know who you are. Just tell me the thing that you were trying to tell me. And that's yeah. that, and see, Matt, that's why eventually we're going to have to let you go because you're from that old school. You say things slowly with information and facts. No one cares. <laughs> and yet here you come to me opening that door once again. I have something that people like. Otherwise, I still wouldn't be here. No, I, I, I get interested in this debate because problem number one is lag. The 2017 regulations that were maximum downforce came about because of something that happened in 2014 that was a passing phenomenon. Yeah. The change in regulations going from 22 to 23, the diffuser throat and floor edge came about because of something that happened at the beginning of 22, where the porpoising seemed potentially unfixable and they were concerned about driver safety. It was fixed by the end of the season, but it was too late to go back on and say, oh, we don't need it after all because the teams were already designing. When we see close racing, it's always at the end of a long and fairly stable regulation set. If you want close racing, you can't keep twiddling the regs every four to six years. That's going to be problem number one. But I think you can just look at the intent of these regulations was to solve a lot of the problems we're talking about. I think the FIA is very aware of it, but sometimes they just change things faster than they, they overreact too soon without letting things really settle first. And yeah, I know sometimes they nerf, but I don't think they found anything in Red Bull setup yet that they could nerf. And they've, Every time they've tried, they've hit some other team by accident. So maybe yeah. they've just decided to back off a little bit. Yeah, Ferrari caught strays in 2022, isn't it? And, yeah. a, and Aston Martin probably uh, last season as well. But, I mean, that's a good question. It, let's put you in charge, Alex, and go nerf Red Bull. Like, like, let's nefariously go for the specific task of nerfing Red Bull. It, it's hard because it doesn't seem like any one particular thing is their massive advantage. They've just got everything. No, because it, it never is that in racing. You know, go go down to your local kart track and there'll be one youngster who's managed to make their kart go quicker than all of the other youngsters. And it won't be just their engine. It'll be their engine and then the Ackerman on the steering and then the gearing they're using and then the technique they're using in turn four uh, and so on and so on and so forth. So it's 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 the same. How... It's the same in, in, in Formula One. I, I do agree with you, though, Matt, that, um, you know, the careful accuracy 
has has rather slipped from from the, you know the vernacular of of F1 journalism in in many ways, and there are there are several actors who will throw their hands up in the air at that statement and go, the careful accuracy bit is what I do, and no one reads it because you know yeah. I, I Summers. because everybody else is screaming about basics. I think you know as as the F1 media we underestimate uh, to our own loss the effect that we can have on policymakers and so yes. when we all scream about you know driver calling in qatar or uh, uh, act reactively around something because we are, are are interested we're passionate and we're interested in the story and also you know writers need something to write talkers need something to say um we start to affect we start to affect pressure on those policymakers which you know, supersedes the big issues to the now issues. And, and I think that costs us. Uh, and it comes out in each regulation set how much it's cost us. Mm, because, yeah, that is interesting. And I think even, you know, people like, I would say like Matt and Tommy, for example, they used to be on WTF1. They're absolutely huge. They kicked off massively in 2018 after the French Grand Prix, which admittedly was a bit of a, it was a bit of a stinker. But you could just feel that spread out from that community of listeners all the way out to Red Bull. You could track it through that and then through Reddit and then out into Twitter. And then suddenly everyone was going, F1's dull and it's broken and it needs fixing. And and so, you know, a lot of people reacted to that. And that was just, you know, two very, inf- inf- well, one very influential person, Matt. Well, here's a fun fact for you. Uh, one of the things I did getting ready for the show was I watched the uh, Mercedes Shovelin interview about it. And they rated this track, the one they just raced on, is the third hardest track all season to pass on. And so if you're going to watch that race and say, fundamentally, Formula One is broke and no one's ever going to catch Red Bull, well, then you've watched one of the worst possible tracks to come to that conclusion on. So uh, as a, uh, I guess a me, uh, me four years ago would have thrown my hands up in the air again and gone... Yeah, and they shouldn't be jumping to conclusions. And uh, yeah, you know, we've all got to we've all got to be massively kind of uh, it, we've all got to be complete petrol heads and totally into it. And if you don't understand Go the angulation else. of the flo- you know, if you don't understand the angulation of the floor stays of that Red Bull, then what are we even doing watching? But you know, the more time I spend in F one broadcasting, the more <laughs> I realise that actually. You know, uh, people like WTF one and and even you know, um, uh, fastening. I'm not, sorry to name other podcasts on your podcast, but sorry. you know, all, all, all sorts of. You're just you're just sorts. naming other podcasts that have accused us of cheating at karting. So that that's the two already. <laughs> so, yeah. But but you know, people need to be able to watch sport casually as well. Yes, and I agree. Not everybody wants to engage with the sport in such depth and we would alienate a huge amount of the fan base um i think it's a question of the interplay between the journalism and the and the regulation makers that needs to maybe be tightened up a bit where kind of perhaps a bit of discernment more on the regulation makers side as to what's noise and what's genuine commentary and critique okay i just need to clarify something i'm going to come off that point but someone in the live chat is asking is there beef with matt and tommy no not at all i doubt they even know who we are but we i went to, i have to tell you alex we went to a, a, a karting event a corporate one uh, well, we were organized it and i brought my team but because brad philpot was in my team and then the other two lads were pretty handy as well they were so quick that they honestly thought i had hired ringers to come and be part of my driving team. I'm like, no, that's just my panel. We are the fastest podcast in F1. Oh, hang on a minute. No, because the BBC one, isn't it? If you got like... So many claims. Yeah, I, so do you know what? Claims. I'll do it. Our top four drivers beat any four of any other F1 podcast, any motorsport podcast in the world. Uh, but yeah, uh, one big thing is, is Matt's lot. You know, the Americans came in with a whole different set of sporting expectations. Like, it's crazy... That how that meeting of worlds has really changed stuff. So like you know the Americans abhor a draw. You know they they don't want they want everything to go down to the wire as well. And so you can see with it being owned by Liberty, I, I can imagine some kind of playoff. You know coming into F one, I don't think that would be inconceivable. 
But, you know, I, I think that if you set out a regulation set, and I, and I really do think it's important not to be too uppity about how we how we go about it, just because, you know, we've done the sport in one way for a long time. It doesn't mean that if there was a playoff or if there is a sprint race, you know, the engineering challenge is the engineering challenge. You're not racing against the track or the tire or the format or the day you're racing against the others, Mm. right? So it's whoever does the best job. Yeah, okay, there are various different formats that highlight various different qualities within groups of people, within drivers and so on. But Formula One is whatever Formula One is, you know, and it's it's the individuals and the team's job to form around the challenge and and, and me and me. How how are you feeling about sprint weekends? Like, where did you start from? Because I'm starting to soften, soften to them a little bit. Like I've just accepted. I'm in the acceptance phase. Yeah, same. Uh, uh, sprint weekends. Uh, my immediate reaction was, why, why, mm. what, what, why do we need that? I don't, I don't understand. And then what I see are, you know, drivers like Piastri uh, making names for themselves True. in sprint races. Different winners, you know, opportunities being snatched and lost. I'm seeing. Uh, Things that go on to affect the Grand Prix, you know, smart heads succeeding, you know, rash moments punished. And I think it's playing into the story of those race weekends quite nicely. Uh, I also do like the fact, and I know it's something that's changing, but I have liked the fact uh, that people who go and visit the track every day, because I really do think that fans who, uh, not that everybody can, I know it's expensive, um and uh and it's not possible for all but if you do go to the track it's cool to see a session that means something isn't it yeah no it is it is but i like that you're now uh you're translating everything into broke for me as well that you know so you can see both sides of it uh but i am going to a race this year so near nearly all booked nearly all booked Uh, there's a challenge here Stuart is saying that the sky f1 podcast might challenge us because they have got, I forgot they had a podcast now. They've got Brundle, Hill, Rosberg, and who's Patrick? Who's Patrick on this guy? No, I don't know. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, is is Brundle senior? Is he, would he still be quick in a go-kart? Would he? Would yeah, he, he would. No, he's good. Damn it. He's good. He's good. Might even, drive, might even drive for me at some point this year. Oh, in that's, the historic. That's a, qu- that's a quirky one, isn't it? He's, <laughs> he's had a... He's had a, a bit of an old injury sorted out, um, hit a wall in Dallas in the 80s and had still a, feeling an it. ankle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 big time. Um, so it's been a bit of a rolling concern over a number of years, but he uh, he's had it sort of uh, mended a bit and is now in recovery mode. So okay. um, if you see him in big trainers, that's, that's, that's why. why. Okay, so that might ruin my claim. Oh, it's Danica Patrick, of course. Oh, yeah, damn it. That's going to oh, be... Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, that does look like a pretty handy team. Uh, Damon Hill, I don't know, he's kind of old. That would be my only, my only hope. And I could never overtake Damon Hill because it would be... I'd be thinking of Schumacher in, in 94 and going, no, after you, Mr. Hill. And uh, do you know what I mean? It would just be justice... Finally, in the same way that Felipe Massa deserves justice, Matt, he has taken it to court. What are the chances then that Hamilton loses his first world championship? Do you like how I went into a news item? I like that. And if you're going to ask me, I'd say based on what I've read so far, pretty much non-existent because they've sort of moved on their claim a little bit from demanding a return of the world championship and are focused more on the financial damages of the loss of the world championship and the subsequent um, controversy, shall we say, not being handled according to FIA rules. But don't they want an acknowledgement from the FIA as well that he's the rightful champion? Uh, That was part of the original ask, but I'm not sure it's going to be what you would call a deal breaker when push comes to shove. I think at the end of the day, they're more focused on the the financial damages, which I think is a smart move from their lawyer, because I did this math a a while ago, and I think I came to the conclusion, more or less, that the only way of the normal ways you would treat a team that cheated like that, you could disqualify them for the whole season, you could disqualify them from the race, you could throw out the results of the race entirely. The only way it works is if you restore the order prior to Mass's pit lane incident, Call that the finish of the race, 
then he wins. Otherwise, it was still kind of Hamilton's championship based on the finishing order in Brazil. Do you have an opinion, Alex? <sighs> Not really. I mean, you, you extend beyond you extend beyond what the rules say. I, I'm an expert on the sporting regulations. I'm an expert on the cars. I know I know me some racing. Uh, how things go in a courtroom, I know very little about beyond the fact that as soon as you go into a courtroom, all bets are off. Mm. Um, you know, is is sort of my only experience of you know, those kind of things in racing that I've seen. So, I mean, anything that I would say about that would be conjecture and what would be the point? Wild speculation. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll give some wild speculation. I, I think it's gonna, they're going to do it. I think they're going to acknowledge that he's the rightful champion because it, it, let's say it goes to court and the monetary value is what it is. When it comes to the, hey, uh, uh, Mohammed Ben Salim, will you please acknowledge that Hamilton didn't win that championship? I think he'll just go, yeah, no, absolutely fine. Yeah, no problem. So I, I don't think they like him very much and I don't think they'll have any problem saying, no, you didn't win it. That's an interesting take. Historically speaking, the FIA and the organizations that preceded it were pretty terrible at acknowledging they'd ever done anything wrong ever. A court might say that it's possible he could have won. But I, I, I think at the end of the day, the rest of the FIA rules, which is pretty much prevent them from changing who won, no matter what a court finds. And that's that's where it's going to stick. Oh, that's, I, yeah, I, I can't remember a I can't remember a reversal of of such magnitude. Yeah, a, a, anywhere in anywhere in sporting history. But like you, like I say, as soon as you go into a courtroom, all bets are off. No, oh, all right. Come on then, let's take twenty twenty one to the courtroom then. If all bets are off, that's the problem, isn't it? If they start reversing that, if yeah, that would be the only thing that would stop them yielding on that, because then they'd have to go back and you know, well, if you yielded on that. You can yield uh, on all the other stuff. Um, a couple of news items then to finish off with, Matt. The sadness of the statement that came out from Mercedes upset me a little. Mercedes do not know what to do to develop the twenty, the W15. That, that was the well, headline. Well, yeah, and, and this is, I, I'd be curious to get, you know, because you've seen them on track. There was a, a lot came out about their uh, deficit in high-speed corners, Specifically, and then you had James Allison interview saying things like, you know, we, we, we have a fundamental issue with this car too. We didn't know we had this fundamental issue basically until we came to this race. We don't know what that fundamental issue is, but we're going to do some experiments. And this is year three of them lacking a very important grasp on some aspect of their car. And, and that's concerning and points to you know, problems on the engineering side, uh, fundamentally, that haven't yet been found and resolved. It's an interesting one, because when Lewis made that comment about missing speed in the high speed corners, he'd just been following the McLaren, which was carrying too much downforce. Yes. Uh, all uh, it, it, through the end of the race in Jeddah. And it was kind of like a just out of the car into the media pen snap judgment from Lewis more than a, I believe. I mean, I, I think more than an incredibly reasoned engineering evaluation. I think it, it'll be interesting. I, I'm going to Australia tomorrow, so I think it's going to be really interesting. I, and I hope I get him in the pen, actually, so that I can ask um, the high speed deficit that you thought you felt in Jeddah, does the data bear it out? Because, you know, uh, it, it's going to be interesting if that's what the data shows. Because around other cars, it didn't look as bad. I mean, it was, it was, they looked best of the rest, you know, after sort of free practice in Jeddah. Yeah. They, the, the race runs that were published looked, looked really good, um, you know, over, over an average stint gap. But it just didn't materialize in terms of stint pace in the race for whatever reason, which is why, which is a super disheartening thing for a driver to have that kind of like, and they've had it and they've done it twice yes. now, yeah. Mercedes, th through the early parts of this year. Like, oh, we're really fast. Oh, actually, no, we're not quite as fast as we thought. Oh, we're really fast. Oh, no, we're not yeah, quite as fast. They looked so well happy then. in testing. Oh, like, James Allison was like giddy. So what were you happy about? And then it's been sort of dashed every day overnight in both those Grand Prix. It's been between the Thursday and the Friday where it suddenly disappeared. And 
it's not really not helped by Hamilton's qualifying at the moment, which has put him down down the order. So he he ended up getting stuck with the McLarens, where you go, well, if he'd have had a good Friday qualifying, you know, maybe he wasn't stuck behind the McLarens, and then and maybe he is able to you know, to show that race pace a bit more, if you like. So I, I, I don't know. I think it's not as bad as it looks, but the, the chances that they overreact, Matt, are, are real. Yeah, well, the issue is really, I think, uh, might be almost more of a driver confidence. One, uh, one thing that Shevlin said in his interview was that when they were in those turns and getting on throttle, they would get snaps of oversteer. And that it was, you know, obviously in the race, it's less of an issue. You're not going as fast, but it was a real problem, especially in qualifying, because as you got on the throttle, you'd get a snap of oversteer and then you'd have to, in order, because the walls are right there, you'd have to back off to make sure you got a lap in and didn't, you know, send your mechanics to the 24 hour repair arama that you, you want to avoid at all cost. I think they're still suffering a little bit with their, their issue very early on in this uh, set of regulations, which is that I mean, I, I'm talking like this set of regulations in general, mm. you know, the ground effect bias one. Um, and it's more a suspension issue. They used to have incredible control of the rear uh, platform of the car. Uh, with all of the clever uh, suspension elements that they had to play with at the rear, that then all got banned. And so what they, their, their aerodynamic concept relied on the, the aerodynamic platform of the rear of the car being in a very narrow window, which they could maintain because their rear suspension was very clever and it could hold it always in the right place. They don't have those elements to play with anymore. So over time, Mercedes have been grappling with broadening the window of where the rear floor will work and because lewis has a style which is a very attacking style with the rear of the car moving around a lot he really struggles when it's when it's moving like that and that's led to some issues in qualifying yeah because uh, to, to follow up sense. on that i'm really yeah. curious because one of the things allison got on about was he felt that fi had made a fundamental error focusing so much on what they call weight control for this regulation set, like it became very important to control the wake, but more important than maybe other things they should have paid attention to. Do you think that, do you think, you know, having seen three years of this now that, that, that he might be correct about that? Or is this Mercedes admitting that they're a little bit stymied here and, and sort of trying to play the refs a little bit to get regulations that help them more coming up in 26? I mean, so the concept of weight control um, is to try to prevent a car affecting the car behind it. So they mean wake of the wings and then they mean wake of the wheels as well, which disturb the air and affect the car that, that's running that's running directly behind it. Um, I mean, the aim of that regulation is not specifically to hurt or hinder any particular team or uh, specifically to play towards you know, any particular, uh, you know, system of aerodynamics. But it could be a factor that the profiles of the rear of the rear wing and the way the rear of the car is working have hindered their sort of aerodynamic mm. technique, if you like, in a way which is not benefiting them and they're struggling to work around where competitors have managed to do it. That being said, they've had enough time now since this iteration of regulations. They've tried two concepts neither of which have really, you know, put them in the position that they were before this re regulation set came in. So, you know, it's hard to argue that it's a fundamental issue with the regulations that's caught them out with this amount of development time to play with. And, uh, thing is, Matt, are they going to fix this in 2026 20, or is it still ground effect? Because the, 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 the danger is that people are going to look back at the ground effect era and think of it as a complete failure. And maybe it's ground effect is too complicated for it to be competitive in a cost cap that might go down as just a, as a dud. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's certainly a lack of historical data for the teams to use. It's a very, very big switch. The last point Allison made, I want to ask you about is he said that these cars are generally not fun for the drivers to drive. And has that something you have heard maybe from time to time when you were interviewing people or is it just, his particular drivers aren't having fun because the car isn't as competitive as they want it to be. Um, I think, yeah, I've heard it several times. I've not heard it in person. I've heard Max say it 
uh, a couple of times because especially with regards to street circuits and similar um i think they're quite heavy cars uh which doesn't help and the the weight bias of the cars doesn't help either um they're pretty sort of soup i mean several teams operating with super stiff chassis setups as well so put yourself in the driver's position you know you're bouncing around you're in quite a heavy piece of machinery by formula one standards you've got all this power underneath you and then you're operating what is an incredibly complex two mo three motor system uh you know to to try to get the most out of the power unit so in many ways yeah, I can. Ar- you can argue that they also don't really deliver that well. Some of them under combined load, which is like braking and turning. Cars are fun to drive when they deliver under combined load because you can kind of slide it in on the brakes and but rotate it. Um, yeah, exactly. That's when you next when you're next selecting which single seater you want to drive. Spanners, you you might want to might want to see which is best under combined well, load. Do you know what we do? Sort of have that when we run our i racing tournaments so we are picking ones and we do pick them for that kind of drivability and like we had one single seat i can't remember which one it was where the rear would just snap the second you tried to do that combined 2. load 5 maybe i think it was the renault 2.0 but brad's saying in real life that wouldn't happen but um but basically the good drivers loved it and then the drivers like like the corporate drivers the dentist where we just found it impossible to get it turned into a corner um but there was one driver um uh, i can't remember i think somebody told me don't tell anyone that i found this out but there was one driver who has had a few spins who apparently had said privately he can't tell when it's about to go and so that's a, quite a big issue so you you can tell it's going to go three three seconds before it does and there's nothing you can do mm. yeah i mean that so that is that is a that is a challenge for the driver the one point i would make though is that they are professional racing drivers doing literally yeah one of the best jobs in the world and get on with you know, son. astronauts <laughs> don't get to astronauts don't get to complain that spaceships aren't comfortable in my view but part of that too is going to be down to the change in tire regulations we went to 18 inch tires with stiffer and shorter sidewalls and the the length of the sidewalls and the compliance of the tire affects how rapidly how much control and feel you have to my understanding. And I'm asking this basically as a question. It it affects how the drivers feel the car in the corner, how much give and how much sidewall you have. Yeah. And and they've just scrapped a potential move back to 16 inch tires this week, which is a real shame. I, I, I get the road relevance of an 18 inch tire, but I just don't get it for racing, you know, to have the spring rate in the tire um, to reduce the weight on all four, four corners of the car. So rotational mass is a disaster. It has more effect on the inertia of the car than any other type of mass. And also mass far away from the center of gravity of the car is even worse. Unsprung rotational mass far away from the center of gravity of the car is literally like, you know, it's like handing uh, it's handing Superman a kryptonite bar and going, yum, enjoy, to to any kind of racing machine. It's just a disaster. Uh, so, what, so what would the, it have done to reduce it to 16-inch? Would it have made a big difference? Yeah, yeah, it would. So you reduce the weight of, of all four corners of the car, the weight of the car generally. And so, you know when, uh, and I've used this is a bit of a tired analogy now, I've used it a couple of times. So you know when a ballerina spins and they put their arms out wide and they spin slower. Yeah, I've been to the Science Museum Wonder Lab. Yeah, I've been on the spinning yeah. one. Yeah. So that is so that's what having heavy wheels does. So why did it they abandon it? Slows the car rotating. Why did they abandon the 16-inch uh wheels? I need to read more than just the headline of the article <laughs> to find out why. And I'm going to be doing that on the 17-hour plane ride <laughs> I have to Melbourne. Oh, no, your life is so terrible. You're inconvenienced slightly for one day and then have amazingness for the rest of the time. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. No one can ring you. And all you've got is Wi-Fi that's just good enough to send emails. Yeah, and, uh, and that, download, and download some in- movies. You can download the Ferrari movie and watch in hysterical horror at the crash scenes yeah it's uh that's a that's a that i have seen the ferrari movie yeah. that is a that is a moment in time isn't i know it? I, w- I, w- I whinged about it with on the joe show show with joe 
But <laughs> the driver gets flung from the car, having clearly shown it nearly stopping as it hits the curb, and then it gets flung through the air like a eye racing crash. Right. I think you've got to go and see it just just for that alone. Uh, Matt, I know we're in your territory here, but tyres. This is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Is okay. Are Pirelli's tyre choices now too influential on F1? Because there are some tyres, there are some compounds and some rates of wear that some teams and drivers can manage, and there are other teams and drivers that cannot manage that. Pirelli must know that. They must know Liberty and the FIA. If we run a step harder, that's going to suit Alonso and Norris. And if we go a step softer, it's going to help Mercedes. They must be aware of that. And so like, there's quite a large influence on the, on the racing itself. Uh, yeah, tires are a very large influence on the racing. I think Pirelli has always known this. You could go back to the previous regulation set um, when uh, I think it was uh, Lotus that became Renault was the only car that would test the tires. And remarkably, they were amazing on them. And then Mercedes did their tire test, and suddenly the tires were better for Mercedes. Pirelli has data from all the teams. I think they try to design to an average. But you have to understand, you know, one of the problems at Jetta is the surface. The tires are very low deck, but they have to be hard because the cars are going so fast around turns. They have to be able to survive the amount mm. of energy. And I saw someone do an analysis and say Max was pulling like 6G in a corner on one of the high-speed corners. I don't know if that's super accurate because this is data coming through F1 TV, but even in that whoa, ballpark- whoa, whoa, whoa. are you saying F1 TV is not accurate? He, 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 Shop, he's, shots fired. He's saying they're a bunch of mugs, don't know what they're talking no, about. No, I'm just, I'm just saying say GPS data has a certain <laughs> ceiling for accuracy when it, when it, when it filters through because, yeah. because there is just a, a level of accuracy beyond what you can't go unless you're- tapped right into some other data stream that that people like us will never get but and it's, you, li it's live delivery as well yeah it's yeah, live yeah. delivery it's not going to be perfect but it's pretty but even ballparking it that's a lot of energy for a tire to absorb especially with a car that heavy so pirelli have to bring a tire that will survive that because you know we've all seen tires explode catastrophically and you don't want that to happen at jetta with a wall just like right over there that you're going to go into but the surface of the track doesn't really degrade the tire all that much. So you don't have like, you know, you go to other circuits and you do have high degradation with the same set of tires. It's, there's not enough money. There's not enough time. There's not enough testing. So they have to be for cautious. Pirelli to have bespoke mm -hmm. tires for each circuit that would put us in the window where we would get like, oh, someone better on the tires will have that big tire advantage. And, and this race was just particularly terrible for that. But do we even do we even want that, Alex, as part of F one? Like, do you would you want to see tire wear, you know, rewarded, or is it good? They're going a step harder. No one has to think about it. No one has to worry about being gentle on their tires. I think it's a general un underestimation of how hard it is. In, in you know, Formula One cars have changed a lot, man. You know, Formula One cars are generating huge amounts of downforce, huge amounts of power, tires. On the other hand, uh, not really changed that much for a long time. You know, you're still dealing with basic radial ply kind of uh, tires. So it's really important not to underestimate how hard it is to make what is ancient technology now, more or less, actually work over a Formula One weekend. Um, so you need multiple compounds. They need to keep on working on tire structure, which is what is what is handles what it is that handles the load uh, that Trumpets is talking about. Um, to the concept that Pirelli could steer the action in some way to towards one team or another team, like while keeping the show on the road, yeah. is. That is I'm, I, don't, I don't think any tire manufacturer could do it's that. It's too, too difficult. So my cynicism is Yeah, unfounded. I don't think it's possible. Hmm. I don't think it's possible. Okay, you're a driver. I have a quick question Me? for you, if I may. Oh, Alex, he means you. I, I do mean mm. the actual driver on oh, the okay. show. Okay, I don't yeah. I mean, yeah. Do you have a race license? Mm. Okay, that's what I mean. All right. <laughs> um, I've been watching Formula One. 
And it strikes me that one of the key skills, one of the things that really sets one driver apart from another over a Grand Prix distance is an ability to manage these tires effectively, particularly in terms of, like you say, when they're under combined loads. Is that, first of all, is that the skill that is most impressive to you as someone who's driven in similar machines? And secondly, we could take like an example like Qatar, where you were never going to have those kinds of issues with tires. Is that where Formula One should be putting the emphasis for differentiating, differentiating drivers, or should it just be who can absolutely flog it the fastest for a very minimum number of laps? Which do you prefer and which do you think is better for the sport long term? Um, yeah. Better for the drivers would be the Qatar situation because that that's that's pure a sport mm. in my in my opinion you know you're dealing with that's that's a race car race you know you're going flat out um you're you're giving it you're giving it everything and i'm a proponent that for example um if we you know when we get into a, a race weekend if we've proved that the softest two compounds work why not why not ban the hardest one and make them run multiple stops to try to to try to make the drivers push for more of the race you could also see it physically yeah it was hot yeah you know there were other reasons but a factor in how tired all the drivers were after the race was just how much time they spent on new tires you know so that that's it's a physical challenge it's a mental challenge for the viewer i think if you saw a race where the tires didn't degrade and all the drivers pushed on a one stop for the full race, you'd be disappointed. Yeah. I, I I think you'd be really disappointed now. With the level of action that we see with, you know, tires falling off the cliff, people really struggling, someone picking up a medium, then it's wrong and descending through the field. I think the viewer would demand tires with degradation again eventually it's an interesting thing in our karting events where the heats which have random grid orders are very exciting to watch and like there's turn one chaos and then you get to the finals and they're just less interesting because if you line up a motor vehicles in pace order and then go okay go and then you're flat out like you are in a kart race yeah not an awful lot happens so yeah do you want the pure motorsport I, to be honest i have enjoyed formula one more since we've had the degrading tires. So yeah, the, the chocolate tires came in and everyone said, oh, that's fun. And the degrading tires, the crossover, uh, Nico Rosberg, Lewis Hamilton in Bahrain, being able to kind of separate out because they were trying to keep them, they were trying to keep them apart for as long as possible. And then converging tire strategies. To me, that was, you know, near perfect. So if they could manufacture somehow a two-stop, just a two-stop race with a variety of feasible uh, strategies, we had it. We already had it, but we we seem to have blown past it, and now every race is a, a one stop. So that's that's the only thing. Is can it just come back a little? Everybody, everybody in every form of motorsport I've ever participated in loves to give the tire manufacturer a right kicking <laughs> okay. after every session because getting your head around the tires is the fundamental point of so much of motorsport now. You know, engines don't blow up anymore as much you know gearboxes don't fail that much it, it, you're having a tire issue is every second race right so and, and that's because they are they're the final frontier of performance but i will say you know from watching you know years of pirelli motorsport now when they first came in i thought you know i was one of those people who thought this company just can't make tires that last yes. more than 10 laps to do that as a supplier marketing your product in Formula One is actually incredibly brave, isn't mm, it? Yeah. To then go and meet to then go and meet that challenge and then later on prove that you can actually make a tire that'll one stop a Grand Prix or develop into a company which can make a tire that can one stop through a Grand Prix. But to go out there and go, Yep, our tires do ten laps, deal with it is a is a is a really brave It's step. a good reminder because reputationally they did take a bit of of damage on that early on and i do remember i think maybe it was 2012 2013 something like that and and being offered a choice just in the garage oh do you want these or do you want pirelli and you go oh no not pirelli because they don't they don't last very long do they so uh and then the exploding tires at silverstone probably you know didn't do them any good either uh but yeah yeah i think it's a harder job than most people 
realise. We have to let you go, Mr Brundle, because you have to go on a plane and watch some movies and relax. And uh, and then I didn't realise that you actually go in the pen and, and point microphones at yeah. people at the Grand Prix these yeah. days because um, I don't get F1 TV. But that's... that's I do. I do. It's it's the only time I'll turn up on a British television screen, but normally with my voice edited out. Uh, uh, but I, yeah. <laughs> for, for, for Formula One, because we provide uh, a lot of those interviews get provided uh, to to various broadcasters. But uh, yes, yes, I've I've had uh, the joy of talking to to many. A well, that's good because straight out of the car, stuff. you get to look in their eyes and just really read how they're feeling. That must be incredible. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. It is, and I always sense a great relief when they get out of the car all sweaty come to the back of the garage stand in front of their boarding that they have to stand in front of look up and there is another racing driver standing there ready to ask them a real question about their real racing car that you know that might make some sense hopefully i try and make some sense to just sort of be a reassuring face that you know will communicate what's going on and right before we go one of our listeners has asked, where can we see you racing in the near future? You can see me racing in the near future in the NLS series. So that's a Nürburgring focused um, uh, GT series. I'm in a Porsche GT3 car. Uh, the Nürburgring 24 hours. Uh, and then if you are UK based uh, or Belgian, every major historic festival in your nation pretty much apart from Zanvoort. We're not going to Zanvoort, but part, but we will be at with the historic cars. I will be at some of them. Some of them, the team will run with other much more competent people driving. Um, but yeah, all the major historic festivals, at least in the UK. And that was going to be, the... that's on the website. It will be on the website. You can find me on social media, Alex Brundle racing at Brundle motorsport at Alex Brundle on Twitter yeah, just type Alex Brundle in and you, you, most of them find me. Well, good. Mostly. You guys and the listener there has managed to just do the outro I was going to do. So I don't really have an outro anymore. That's <laughs> that's all I was going to do. Follow me and Matt, I suppose, as well. Uh, please, if you don't follow me on Twitter, just go and do it anyway. I'm close to 20K and I'll, I'll feel like a proper grown up on social media if i get there so at spanners ready all alex's links will be at the the top of the show notes and matt is at matt pt 55 matt is there a announcement that you would just like to make are we ready uh, are we ready uh, we are officially re- i have two okay one of them is really important and the other one's about me go on then go on let's let's get it let's get out i'm sure alex all would right. want to hear about it alex has got his checkbook ready to purchase this item to that purchase, he can purchase. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, my wife amanda weaver on the social medias, has an official two-book deal with Zandos Publishing on the imprint Slow Burn, which launch party I'm still recovering from two nights ago, to publish two Formula One romance novels. First one should be on sale this fall, so look for it, but, you know, probably you won't have to because I'll just not be be shutting up about it. We'll be yelling about it. It's a romance novel where the author's primary romantic input is matt trumpets so it's very hard not to think about this as matt trumpets romance fanfic that might add to the value of those books or take away that's up to you but also put pressure on matt to let me audition for the the male part in the audiobook but massive uh, yeah i'll let you know about that when they when they get to that point that's a, that, i, I yeah, don't yeah, think yeah, yeah. i don't think we have a ton of input into it yeah yeah no 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 i know and know when i see it it was the same looking at 